Okay, I can see that we're at 7.01. So in the interest of time and getting everybody in and out quickly, let's get started. Welcome and good evening. Uh, this is the April edition of the No to Prevent virtual speaker series. We're happy to have you all here with us. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, No to Prevent is a collaborative, uh, a, a collaborative of youth focused coalitions and agencies in Westchester working together to provide our parents and caregivers with essential tools to increase resilience, increase resiliency in our children and to reduce risky behaviors. Uh, to find out more about us, you can visit our website, which is listed down at the bottom here, as well as links to previous recordings and upcoming presentations. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, tonight's presentation is being recorded. All the participants will receive a link, as well as all those that registered for the presentation, along with a handout called the tip jar. The tip jar will highlight key takeaways, information, and prompts from tonight's speaker, Dr. Jernigan, for you to keep as a reference. He has also graciously uh, allowed us to include a copy of the slides of his presentation, so you will have that as well. There will be a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we encourage you to type mm -hmm. in questions you may have during the presentation into the Q&A box. So at this time, I would like to introduce the, one of our lead coalitions in the speaker series, Colleen Anderson, who is the coalition coordinator for uh, Cortland Community Coalition. Colleen? Thank you, Lisa. That's right, I am the coalition coordinator. Um, our coalition was formed in 2004 and we are still going strong. Our mission is to educate the Cortland community on the dangers of underage drinking and drug use so we can be safe, stay safe, healthy, and drug free. We are so proud to be one of the lead sponsor coalitions in the Know to Prevent Collaborative and work with my prevention colleagues throughout Westchester. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker in our series. Dr. J David Jernigan is a professor at Boston University School of Public Health Department of Health Law, Policy and Management. He is best known for his action research approach to the issue of alcohol advertising, marketing and promotion and its influence on young people. His work has led to better advertising regulations and a clearer understanding of the evolving structure of the alcohol industry. His work is policy relevant and scientifically rigorous. Dr. Jernigan has been very active in translating research findings into policy and practice. He testifies regularly at city, state, and national levels around alcohol, advertising, and youth, alcohol availability, and taxation. He also trains advocates around the world using the best evidence. Welcome, Dr. Jernigan. Thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, to quote uh, Jimmy Carter, that's the best in, uh, introduction I've had recently. <laughs> no, really, I, I hear so many of my introductions and they're often scripted and you did your own and that was lovely, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Uh, I'm assuming that you can see my screen at this point. Uh, and uh, so just a little more about me. Um, I am the son of a Methodist minister and a public health nurse. So what you see today is a bizarre combination of the two. I was raised in the Protestant tradition of social justice and doing the right thing. I was also raised with little or no alcohol at home. My father would have a beer once a year with his students and then would store the beer until the next year, which showed you how much he knew about beer. <laughs> um, I'm a parent and a grandparent, uh, and uh, I'm in this because of my personal story, not about alcohol, but about what I was taught by my parents to do, which was to speak truth to power and to stand up for what's right. So I wanna say a little bit at the outset because you hear so much about what a divided country we are these days, and I wanna remind us about some things that I think unite us. I think we're very united in the sense that everyone should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that as part of this, we should all have equal access to the opportunity to be healthy throughout the course of our lives. I think we're also united around the need to protect vulnerable groups, including young people from being deprived of these rights. And our common concerns are the basis for our common efforts. So from my mother, I get a great deal of respect for public health evidence. 
we used to, I thought it was hysterical as a child because we got a publication every week called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I thought who the heck would ever read anything with such a grim title and now I publish in it. But I try to work from the evidence the evidence is actually part of what gives me an abiding sense of hope. We know so much more about this topic, this issue, and what to do about it than we did when I started in this field almost 35 years ago. So I'll come back to hope a little later in the presentation. But I want to start tonight by talking a little bit about alcohol and the current pandemic. And let's start with the World Health Organization. When the pandemic first hit worldwide, WHO advised that alcohol consumption is associated with a range of communicable and non-communicable diseases and mental health disorders, which can make a person more vulnerable to COVID-19. In particular, alcohol compromises the body's immune system and increases the risk of adverse health outcomes. Therefore, people should minimize their alcohol consumption at any time, and particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. That's the health advice. Just a little bit more about why. It's because it turns out that alcohol is bad for your immune system generally, and it's particularly bad for your lungs. I'm not gonna go into the details on this graphic. The short version is alcohol weakens the ability of the lungs to fight off pathogens. And people with alcohol use disorders therefore are more susceptible to respiratory pathogens, including having a two to four times greater risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is one of the key causes of death in the COVID-19 pandemic. David, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but um, is there a way to put you in a uh, full presentation mode? We're seeing kind of the I, next slide. Sorry, I thought I was. So I absolutely can, and thank you for that. Um, I just... Yeah, just a minute. Mm -hmm. There we go. Stop sharing and we'll reshare. Technology is a wonderful thing, but it keeps us on our toes. Or makes us all look like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I should be able to do this right. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Slide up. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So that's alcohol and health during the pandemic. What's happened with alcohol and consumption in the wake of the pandemic? And we have a number of surveys that have been coming out. I'm going to focus mainly on the peer reviewed ones. One of the first ones to appear came from Research Triangle Institute. They surveyed 993 people in May of last year, 555 of them had been drinkers as of February. And they asked them to recall their consumption pre-COVID and then report how much they were consuming in April. What they found was a 27% increase in average drinks per day, a 21% increase in the number of people drinking above the dietary guidelines for alcohol use, 26% increase in binge drinking, and a particular group, 5%, who had increased all three of these, being female, being black, and are having children in the household was associated with significant increases on at least one measure. And the largest increases occurred among people who both increased their usual quantity consumed and who were not drinking in excess of the dietary guidelines in February. We have another study, this came out uh, in JAMA Open from, uh, the from folks at RAND, um, they had a panel that had been running for a number of years. They had surveyed them in uh, April to June of 2019, and they surveyed them again tw uh, May to June of 2020. Remember, these are 30 to 80 year olds, so we don't get any of the young people and young adults here. But what they found was the overall number of days people were drinking had grown by 14%. Uh, and found the growth, particularly among women, 41% increase in the days of heavy drinking, one day more for one out of five women, and a 39% increase among women in the short inventory of problems score, indicative of increased alcohol-related problems independent of the level of consumption for nearly one in 10 women. 
We have a study of young adults from Washington State. This is a look at a longitudinal cohort. This is about the fifth or sixth year they've been following them. Uh, and so they too were able to compare uh, January and April, May. Uh, and uh, they found, although the number of drinks stayed constant, how many days people were drinking increased. The drinking per occasion fell slightly. Um, the changes in binge drinking occasions were non-significant, but most importantly and strangely, everything's headed down that I've reported so far except number of drinking days, but young people thought more of their peers were drinking more during the lockdown and drinking as a maladaptive coping measure, method, that is to cope with feelings of depression, that increased, All right? Another study, a thousand students at Kent State surveyed late March where they were asked for retrospective as well as current drinking, early May and early June, heavily female sample, risky drinking increased from wave one and remained higher at wave three. And the one factor that was associated with an increase in risky drinking across all four time periods was loss of income or employment related distress due to the pandemic. Then we have a couple of convenience samples, 832 people recruited via social media, email and snowballs. Again, heavily female, heavily white, but 60% reported increased drinking, 13% decreased. And people who reported COVID related stress we're consuming more drinks on more days. Another study, 417 participants against heavily, have, again, heavily female. Fewer people were using alcohol during social distancing, but among those who drank, frequency and quantity of drinking increased. Another group that we have some data on are people with alcohol use disorders, who people who already had it. Uh, and turns out this is a huge risk factor for more serious consequences from uh, COVID-19. Uh, looking at 188,000 patients in the New York City hospital system, January of October of 2020, people who had alcohol use disorders were almost seven times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 than people who didn't. And uh, giving audit tests April to September, that's the alcohol use disorders identification test. Um, under lockdown, and this was a study that looked at states that locked down and states that didn't lock down. The states that locked down alcohol use disorders increased. When they were not under lockdown, they did not increase. Okay, so that's a lot of studies. What's the bottom line here? Clearly some people, particularly women and young adults, have been increasing their drinking during the pandemic. And one of the scary things that we have, another data point, is alcoholic liver disease admissions at a number of major hospitals, Keck in USC, several others, reporting anywhere from a 30 to 50% increase in alcoholic liver disease admissions in 2020 versus 2019, with more cases presenting among people under 40 and more cases presenting under women. Now, the main countervailing trend around drinking during the pandemic is a fair amount of people have had a lot less money and it takes money to drink. So that's the one protective thing. Now let's look at what's been happening in terms of sales. And this is just a whole lot of headlines coming out of the industry uh, sort of in the early months of the pandemic. Um, all the changes that were happening in terms of alcohol availability that I'll talk about in a minute. But right when the lockdowns occurred, suddenly there was a huge increase in off-premise sales, that is sales from liquor stores, grocery stores, if it's allowed there, uh, et cetera, as opposed to bars and restaurants. Um, Ready-to-drink cocktails almost doubled, uh, and consumers were purchasing bigger and cheaper. They were buying 24 and 30 packs of beer, and they were buying three liter boxes of wine, both uh, in the stores and online. A week later, those sales were still up. The big question at the time, were people stockpiling or was this stoking consumption? As we've moved forward in time, it's clear. They were not stockpiling because it kept up, kept up into May. Uh, this is uh, quotes from the industry. 
uh, in early May. It's been somewhat like Christmas in March and April. They're going for bigger cases of the main brand. They've been exponentially buying more. We knew there would be tremendous demand. We thought it would slow down in April, and it turns out it didn't slow down. So that's primarily from the off-premise, but in-person sales. But the other thing that's happened during the pandemic is alcohol is, in a certain sense, gotten a lot easier to get. In New York State, as in a lot of other places, alcohol sales were deemed essential businesses. So the off-premise outlets never shut down. The bars and restaurants have shut down. But what opened up massively was home delivery suddenly get the door, it's the liquor store. And companies like Drizzly, which was re recently bought by Uber, described itself as the number one alcohol delivery app, partners with more than 2,500 retailers across North America in door-to-door -door delivery, delivery of beer, wine, and spirits. As of May, their sales were up 357% over what they would expect to see during that time. Uh, they have done land office business uh, and customers were also ordering more frequently and in larger quantities. So we've got big changes in alcohol availability that have happened under the pandemic. To-go sales are up. Bars and restaurants are closed. Uh, home delivery and carry out cocktails have become normalized. And bars have increasingly morphed into restaurants, selling a couple of things, you know, putting in equipment so they could sell some French fries or something so that they could participate in the carry out business and not have to shut down completely. Countervailing factors, it's been the economic woes, the likely outcome, people were buying more and they've been buying cheaper. In New York State, take hot alcohol and home delivery were permitted. What does this mean for public health? This shift from on-premise to off-premise consumption is likely to be associated with an increase in interpersonal violence. On-premise, at least there's somebody there watching the drinking. Off-premise, who knows who's drinking it, who knows how much they're drinking, and so on. And the data are in, I'll talk about them more later, um, but off-premise consumption, significantly more likely to be associated with violence. Important to keep in mind that worldwide, 63% of violent injuries in emergency rooms involved alcohol use by the victim, perpetrator, or both. In the US, 55% of victims of domestic violence who could report whether their attacker had been drinking believed they had. NBC News reached out to 22 police departments across the nation in late March. 18 out of 22 reported an increase in domestic violence calls. At the same time, confinement, unemployment, economic instability, and alcohol consumption increasing, they all increase the risk of child abuse. And this is happening at the same time when the usual avenues for reporting children who are being abused, the gatekeepers who would notice and report it like teachers, social workers, or pastors are shut down from contact with the students with the children. So who's minding these stores? This is what in social science refer to as we refer to as a large scale national experiment. This is a big change in alcohol availability. The people paying the most attention to it are the ones who stand to make the most money from it. There's just no way that public health research can move quickly enough to keep up with these policy changes. I'm talking with colleagues now about writing the grants to do the evaluations, but we can't keep up with this kind of policy change. And these recent changes have a good chance of becoming permanent without sustained public health input. Home delivery, take out alcohol are both uh, seriously in danger of going the same way as the 2017 temporary tax cut on alcohol at the federal level. That tax cut was just recently made permanent. Okay, so let's just back off for a minute and talk about alcohol and health more generally. Globally, it's a product that kills about 3 million people a year. It's the leading risk factor for death and disability among people ages 15 to 49, and the major driver of health inequality, in that the same amount of alcohol will do much greater harm in a poor family, community, or country. 
In 2016, alcohol caused more death and disability worldwide than tuberculosis, HIV, diabetes, hypertension, digestive system diseases, road traffic crashes, or violence itself. Alcohol is a causal factor in more than 200 disease and injury conditions. For things like cancer, there is no safe level of alcohol consumption, and alcohol is causally linked. It is a cause of cancers of the oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, liver, colorectum, and female breast. You hear a lot about the health benefits of light drinking. That research literature is collapsing as science, scientists take a closer look at it, but even if that benefit were there, there's no research that shows any benefit for anyone under age 44. The big challenge with alcohol though, is it's the great cofactor. It doesn't get reported, it doesn't get noticed, and yet if alcohol's on the picture, in the picture, we are so much more likely to see interpersonal violence, sexual assault, child abuse, family instability, and community disruption. I like to decorate my slides with ironic, uh, use of alcohol ads. So this is an ad for Pinnacle Whipped Cream Vodka with the appalling to me tagline, been whipped lately, uh, given alcohol's relationship with interpersonal violence. Alcohol and health here in the US, product causes about 104,000 deaths a year, according to CDC, one in 10 deaths among people of working age caused by excessive alcohol use. Alcohol plays a key role in what epidemiologists are calling the diseases of despair, poisoning, suicide, liver cirrhosis, the diseases that together uh, explain this unprecedented drop in life expectancy for middle-aged American adults. And if you break these down, you hear a lot about the opioids. Let's talk about the alcohol, poisoning and overdose. Uh, Alcohol-specific death rates for 18 to 34-year-olds are up 69% from 2007 to 2017. Alcohol-induced deaths up 1.4-fold since the turn of the century. Suicides, of which 23% are considered attributable to alcohol use, up 1.3-fold. Liver cirrhosis also increasing. And a recent study in the British Medical Journal looked at health claims from 12 million people and these diseases of despair. And they found that alcohol, these deaths of despair, found that alcohol was responsible for 54% of those deaths. It is rising the slowest because it started at the highest level. Prevalence is up 37% over the years 2009 to 2018. It is steadily the largest cause of the diseases of, of the deaths of despair. What's happening with alcohol and health in the US? Our population is drinking more. Across the whole population, the first roughly 10 years of this century, uh, consumption was up 11%, high-risk drinking was up almost 30%, and diagnosable alcohol use disorders up by almost 50%, with the increases greatest among women, older adults, racial and ethnic minorities, and people with low income or educational attainment. Problems have also been increasing. From 2000 to 2016, the death rates from alcohol were up by 55%. Emergency department visits regarded involving alcohol consumption grew by 62%, costing about $15 billion, with the annual percentage change larger for females than for males. And then finally, the age-adjusted death rate for alcoholic liver disease was up by almost 41%, with the increase highest among women and young people. This chart is just what's been happening with per capita consumption in the US. You can see uh, we've been rising roughly since the early 90s. There was a dip during the Great Recession, uh, and then we've been rising fairly steadily since then. This is really expensive. This costs our country about $249 billion in 2010. That was approximately $2.05 per drink. Two in five of those dollars are paid directly by government. This is not coming just from addiction. This comes mostly from people who would not qualify for an alcohol dependence diagnosis. There are so many people that drink in a risky way. So much of the time, they cause the bulk of the problems. Real quick look at New York State. This is just from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle. They track the various risk factors causing 
uh, Dally's uh, dis dis death and disability adjusted life years. So these are years of life lost due to death and disability. Alcohol was the number seven cause in 1990, and it was the number seven cause in 2019. Youth drinking, a little more good use, news here. Alcohol is still the number one drug problem among young people. About 7 million young people between the ages of 12 and 20 reported drinking in the last month, and 4 million reported binge drinking in 2019. But every year, we lose 3,400 people under 21 because of excessive alcohol use. Every day, about 4,000 kids under age 16 start drinking. This is a problem because the earlier they start, the worse the consequences. Those who start drinking before age 15, five times more likely to develop alcohol problems later in life, four times more likely to become dependent, six times more likely to be in a physical fight or a motor vehicle crash because of drinking, five times more likely to suffer from other unintentional injuries such as drownings or falls. Here's the good news. Young people's drinking has been dropping in this country. And a lot of people credit this to the iPhone or to mobile phones. Young people are going out less. They're spending a whole lot more time in their rooms. We're seeing higher risk of depression, but lower incidence of things like binge drinking, uh, teen pregnancy, uh, and so on. At the same time, the pink line here is females. The blue line is the males. And you can see the girls have caught up to and slightly surpassed the boys in prevalence of binge drinking. So what do we do about this mess? The most common answer to that for young people is, well, we just need to educate them. If they knew the risks, they would drink responsibly. I wish this worked. Unfortunately, it doesn't even work with adults. If we were all together, I'd ask you, how many of you know that you should get a uh, good solid aerobic exercise three to four times a week. And then how many of you have gotten good solid aerobic exercise in the last three or four times in the past week? There's a big gap between knowledge and behavior, but it's even worse for young people because of how our brains develop. The brain is still developing very quickly and it's got a lot of plasticity in adolescence. It doesn't mature completely until at least age 25 and it develops asynchronously. That is the area that process emotions, social information, reward, instant gratification develops before the area that is all about planning ahead, deliberative thinking, weighing cost and benefits and regulating your impulses. All right, so that's the limbic system versus the prefrontal cortex. Here's the limbic system. Here's the prefrontal cortex. And here's your limbic system developing before your prefrontal cortex. There is a window of vulnerability in adolescence. That's one big reason why we care so much about adolescence and alcohol. So what do we do about it? This is known as the health impact pyramid and I've adapted it for alcohol. So let's just go right to that. The point of this is that the bulk of what we do in public health counseling and education actually has the smallest impact. We need to go down in the pyramid if we're going to have the bigger impact. If we look at this applied to alcohol, the most common thing you'll see out there is alcohol education and counseling and SBIRT, screening and brief intervention with a referral to treatment. The next level, evidence-based treatment. And then population level access to treatment and screening and brief intervention and strong media campaigns, that is media campaigns with enough funding to break through the clutter. Those are all fine things to do. They won't be terribly controversial. They don't need a lot of political will. They also don't have nearly as much impact as when you move down here. And this is where I've spent most of my career. Removing dangerous products like alcoholic energy drinks, big victory in this country. You can no longer get malt-based alcoholic beverages that have stimulants like caffeine and guarana and taurine added to them. Increasing excise taxes, reducing the number of alcohol outlets, reducing social hosting, reducing and restricting alcohol marketing. I'll talk more about the, all of those in a few minutes. And then of course, the biggest bang for the buck is uh, these large-scale things, reducing poverty, increasing education, employment opportunities more generally, and improving human rights. But as you go further down in the paragraph, par pyramid, you can see much more political will is needed. All right, 
So screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment, really promising, particularly looks like you can work uh, doing it electronically according to CDC. Treatment is the ethical responsibility of a humane society that makes products like alcohol widely available, but we are never gonna treat our way out of this problem for the simple reason that so many of the people causing the problem will never qualify for a diagnosis. This is particularly true for young people. Classic young person has their first six pack of beer, drives a car uh, into a tree. They've clearly caused an alcohol problem, but it's very unlikely that they would uh, have had enough experience, done enough drinking to qualify for a diagnosis. The problem with the screening and brief intervention with young people is it's expensive and difficult to have enough touch points to capture the group at risk. I work with a group of 18 Second, uh, post-secondary institutions, colleges and universities in Maryland. We're trying to get screening in places like the academic assistance centers, the athletics program, the Greek systems, et cetera, um, as opposed to just in the health and wellness center where we often find the young people too late. Drink driving, we've done good things there, but we basically plateaued at about 10,000 deaths a year. That's 10,000 too many. Utah implemented 0.05 in January of 2019. And lo and behold, uh, the economy in Utah did not collapse, which is what the industry had predicted. Um, it was recommended by a National Academy of Sciences panel that I served on last year. 0.05 is the standard in most of our peer wealthy countries, but not here. We need to keep doing what we're doing with drink driving. We need to do it better, but Part of what we do with alcohol in this country is we let drink driving and 21 carry all the water. And those two sets of policies, they kind of hang out there on their own. They would be much more effective if the rest of the policy package uh, were in sync with them as well. All right, so what does that policy need to look like? Well, package need to look like, well, You've heard me say, you know, education and persuasion, we can't count on those. We're not gonna stop trying, but we can't count on them. What can we count on? Increasing taxes, regulating alcohol outlet density, making commercial hosts liable for bad things that happen after people drink in their establishments. Avoiding privatization, not an issue in New York State, but maintaining limits on days and hours of sale and enhancing enforcement of laws prohibiting alcohol sales to minors. So now, again, if we were all together, I would ask you to brainstorm with me. Why do young people drink? And we'd get a lot of answers because their peers do it, peer pressure, whatever. Let's see what the research says. The research says very clearly young people drink because the adults are drinking. At the state level in the US, young people's drinking is highly correlated with adult drinking. So I'm sorry, but if we want to really make a difference, in young people's drinking, we also have to look at the drinking that the adults are doing. There's an important note to this, which is that drinking is actually much less common even among adults than many people think. Less than 60% of people ages 18 and above had alcohol in the past month in the US. This is from prior to the pandemic. So it isn't everybody's doing it, but boy, does it look like it sometimes. Why do young people drink? Because they can, because it's cheap, because it's readily and easily available. Why do they not drink? One of the biggest um, factors here is religion and culture. And religion and culture are powerful still among the lives of at least some young people. Black churches are one of the reasons many of us think black young people drink less uh, than white young people. Um, but the thing about alcohol is it carries culture itself very readily. And alcohol marketing is all about creating drinking cultures. That's what the industry is doing all the time with its marketing. It is attaching alcohol to everything in our cultures and subcultures. And why do young people drink? Because they've been exposed to the marketing. So let's talk about alcohol marketing. I like to call it the most effective form of alcohol education. In public health, we talk a lot about 
environments and environmental strategies. This is basically just, we have public health problems when there's an environment that permits the agent, in this case, alcohol, to interact with the host, in this case, young people, in a harmful way. Well, the most active player in the alcohol environment is the alcohol industry. So when I start thinking about this from an environmental perspective, I think about it through the industry's um, view of the four P's of marketing, product, promotion, price, and place. Starting with product, let's talk about Alcopops. The industry themselves said when they first came out, they were designed for, quote, entry-level drinkers and those who didn't like the taste of beer, read young females. Even though most of them had distilled spirits in them, the industry claimed they were made from beer so they could be taxed lower, sold in grocery and convenience stores, and advertised on television. And oh, by the way, at their peak, they were most popular among the youngest drinkers. This is 2004 data. And they were most popular among females in every age group. All right. That was the beginning. The next step, the alcoholic energy drinks. Marketed like a battery in a can. The research on these was that basically they were creating a population of wide awake drunks. We caught it early because they were showing, young people were showing up in emergency rooms. Um, when testing was done, subjectively people who drank these beverages thought they were not intoxicated, but if you gave them motor coordination and visual reaction time tests, they were still just as impaired. Okay, we got rid of them. Powdered alcohol, not a product I think the world really needed designed so that it, supposedly so that hikers could have a cosmopolitan to separate, to celebrate when they reached uh, the top of the, of the mountain. Numerous states, including New York, passed laws to ban the sale of alcoholic Kool-Aid, good thing. But then we have alcoholic soda pop. And then beyond that, we have what we call son of alcopops, the supervised sized alcopops, juice for loco. These started out as 23 and a half ounces of 8% alcohol. They then went up to 12%. And now they're up to 14% alcohol. This is the equivalent of a six pack in a can. And this is one place where the Federal Trade Commission did act. They asked for a survey size label. So there is a serving size label on here. The company that produces them is lying because it's the exact same label for each different percent of the, of the product, the 14%. The 12% both say four and three quarters uh, uh, servings in the container. And by the way, nobody drinks these. Nobody drinks these to share. You pop the top, you unscrew the top, whatever, and people are drinking it as a single serving. Consuming one of these cans over the course of two hours can put youth and young adults well over 0.08. Even with the label, studies of college students find they underestimate the number of drinks in the can or in the bottle by two or more. The more potent the beverage is, the more inaccurate they are. They misunderstand what their blood alcohol concentration will be. And YouTube is littered with videos of kids guzzling these. Just last week, a mother and father in Washington state were killed in a car crash by a woman who told police she'd quote, had a four loco. Yeah, officer, I only had one drink. That turns out it was a can, a single can that had the equivalent of five to six drinks in it. After that, the hard seltzers packaged just like sparkling water, very confusing. So what do we do about our product? The model is Washington state. In 2014, they allowed the city of Olympia to create an alcohol impact area where the city could ban the sale of nine particular products. It's later expanded to the whole state and uh, cities can now ban as many as 64 specific products, including juice for loco and so on. All right, moving on to taxes. I love quoting to start here, Adam Smith, the godfather of uh, capitalism, sugar, rum, and tobacco are commodities which are nowhere necessaries of life, which are become objects of almost universal consumption, which are therefore extremely proper subjects of taxation. Thank you, Adam Smith. What do we know about this? In this sense, alcohol is an ordinary commodity in that if you increase the price, usually through raising the tax on it, people will drink less. And when people drink less, there's less abuse 
and there's less drinking and driving, violence and crime, poor reproductive outcomes like risky sexual behaviors and sexually transmitted uh, infections, and lower liver cirrhosis mortality. Unfortunately, this is what's happened to the real value of federal taxes on beer in the US that blue line is the revenue, the red line is the tax per barrel. There was a spike in 91, that was the Bush one tax increase. And we haven't carried this out to include the latest tax increase. Basically at the federal level, these taxes bring in what my colleagues on Capitol Hill call budget dust. Post prohibition, when alcohol was made legal, fully legal again, alcohol revenues were 9% of the federal budget. They are now less than 0.4% of the federal budget. I don't have these figures for New York state. This is Massachusetts. And this is typical of what's happened in state after state. A colleague of mine in Texas calls state alcohol taxes a poorly performing revenue source. I was very active in Maryland in the 2011 effort to increase the sales tax on alcohol there. We won that battle. Uh, it's raising more than $70 million a year for a whole bunch of good causes, including alcohol and other drug prevention, services for people with developmental disabilities, and so on. And there are three evaluations of it that have been done. It led to a 24% drop in gonorrhea cases, a 3.8% drop in alcohol sales compared to what they would have been otherwise, and a 6% drop in the number of alcohol positive drivers on Maryland roadways. That's price, let's move on to place. The bottom line here is the more available alcohol is, the more people will drink and the more there will be problems. This is true of the general population. It's also true of young people. Alcohol outlet density affects young people. It influences how many ads they see. The more outlets close to home are associated with earlier use, more binge drinking and drinking and driving. When outlets cluster, they start competing with each other on price, which makes it even cheaper and even more motivation to sell to younger customers. And young adult injuries as well from accidents, assaults and traffic crashes are all related to off-premise density of outlets. Now the federal government has this pathetically underfunded. It was funded at a million dollars. Now it's funded at $2 million uh, campaign around underage drinking. Uh, it is completely drowned out by the alcohol ads that are all around us all the time, convincing us that everybody is doing this. All right. When the outlets go up, so does violence and crime, STIs, noise, injuries, property damage, and we've had a major change in alcohol availability during the pandemic. So what's happening with all this during the pandemic? Who's minding these stores? This is another natural experiment. It's important to remember 47% of homicides are attributable to alcohol use, according to CDC. So they wouldn't have happened if alcohol use weren't in the picture. The New York Times has reported on this amazing increase during the pandemic. Uh, uh, in the number of homicides across 37 cities. They did a whole article on it. I wrote a letter to the editor and I said, look, what about alcohol? You've mentioned all sorts of other causes of this. What about alcohol? They didn't print it. It's all right, I'm gonna keep talking. The importance of alcohol advertising and promotion to this industry cannot be underestimated. This is an oligopolistic industry that is, and it, it is an industry that is dominated by a few large companies, and they want to keep it that way because that helps them be more profitable. Marketing functions as what economists call a substantial barrier to entry to small firms trying to get into this, into this marketplace. Anheuser-Busch InBev's cost of advertising per barrel of beer that they sell is significantly lower than its competitors. The same likely of Diageo, true of Diageo, the world's largest spirits maker. This is the eighth most profitable industry in the world, more profitable than soft drinks, less so than tobacco. And all this marketing helps the industry counter the increasingly bad health news trotting out from the public health field of that alcohol. We had a victory in New York City. I am so thrilled. 2017, the MTA banned alcohol ads on New York City buses, subways, cars, and stations. 
keep an eye on it. We had that victory in Boston as well and uh, in 2012, and they overturned that in 2017. But this is really alcohol marketing 1.0. The action around alcohol marketing is increasingly happening in social media. So let's take a quick look at that. Facebook, things like from Four Loco. If this isn't you after Thanksgiving, you're doing it wrong. Fireball Whiskey, another one of my least favorite products. I'm still hungover from last night, and the only cure is more Fireball. Instagram, DJ Khaled, very popular among young people and got in a lot of trouble because it was discovered that he had a big contract to promote Ciroc Vodka. He was featuring it prominently in his Instagram feed with no indication that this was a paid promotion. He had to pull back, but he is so not alone. The Australians are tracking this much better than we are. Study by them looked at the top 70 Australian Instagram influencers and their alcohol-related content. 73% of the top influencers featured alcohol brands in their Instagram accounts in the past year. 39% of those were undisclosed. Let's move over to Twitter. This is from our friends at Four Loco. I actually picked this one up because yes, I do occasionally peek at the Four Loco Twitter feed. I just happened to pick this up. I was not systematically monitoring. I brought it to the attention of the general counsel of the Beer Institute. She brought it to Four Loco and I got a very nice letter from Four Loco saying, we were shocked. Somehow this skipped through, uh, slipped through our otherwise careful vetting. Who knows whether it was a slip, whether it's an aberration, Nobody's systematically monitoring this. Snapchat, Diageo got in a whole lot of trouble because young people were using this Captain Morgan ghost, putting their faces in it and then sending it to their friends over Snapchat. They had to pull all their advertising for all their brands off of Snapchat because there was such a to-do over that. YouTube, so YouTube in December just put in place a policy where if you can, you can block alcohol and gambling ads in your YouTube feed. But how many people know about that and who knows how to do it? And by the way, the alcohol ads on YouTube are getting millions and millions of viewers. They can show things on YouTube that they can't on television. They're longer, they're more immersive and they're pull. Uh, TV is a push advertising medium. YouTube is a pull, you're choosing to see it. So advertisers assume you're paying more attention. What do we know about exposure on YouTube? Can kids actually see this? This was a 2015 study. The researchers looked at the 16 brands that a study we had done uh, uh, showed were the most preferred by underage drinkers. The researchers created fake profiles with ages 14, 17, and 19. YouTube at the time had a policy that if your YouTube age was 21 or it was under 21, you weren't supposed to be able to subscribe to the alcohol branded YouTube channels, every single one of those profiles could subscribe to the channels and on average two thirds of the brand channels were successfully viewed. Why does this matter? I've been part of the body of research that's looked at alcohol advertising and kids. I did the most recent systematic review. An earlier one found 13 studies, we found 12 more longitudinal studies following groups of kids over time what the studies find over and over again across different countries, different durations, et cetera, is the more kids are exposed, the more likely they are to start drinking or if already drinking to drink more. We did a deeper dive in 2011. Uh, we did the only survey that's ever been done in the US of young people's alcohol consumption by brand. This was a cross-sectional survey, one point in time, so you can't make causal statements from it. What we could do though, is use it to refute some common myths. One of which that uh, young people drink the same brands as adults. Nope. Young people drink the cheapest brands. Nope, only one of the 25 cheapest brands in our survey was among the most popular brands uh, among young people. Um, kids drink the brands that are easiest for them to get. Nope, in fact, even when kids are stealing it from the parents' liquor cabinet, they're stealing the good stuff. And how do they know what the good stuff is? 
We were also able to associate brand and type of alcohol with specific consequences so that kids who are drinking eight specific brands were more likely to experience fights and industry injuries. Kids who drank those supersized alcohol pops were six times more likely to suffer injuries. And then we had data on their exposure. The kids self-reported their exposure and self-reported exposure to brand kids who had seen a brand's advertising three times more likely to be drinking that brand. And then we had the Nielsen data, population level exposure, which is associated with a five times greater likelihood of youth consuming that brand. In, is this a causal relationship? In epidemiology, there are criteria for determining causation. They're called the Bradford Hill criteria. It's a checklist. Two colleagues of mine published an article last year. They looked at the whole body of literature here and they went down the checklist. Is the association strong? Yes, it is. Is there a dose response relationship? Yes, the more kids see, the more they're likely to drink or to drink more. Is there a temporal association? Yes, the longitudinal studies show us that. Is it consistent? Yes, we find it in different locations, populations, and circumstances. Is it specific? Yes, that's what the brand data shows us. Is it plausible? Yep. Is there experimental evidence? Yes, there's another body of studies that have looked experimentally of groups of people. What happens when you show them alcohol ads and then give them a choice of what to drink? Is it coherent? That is their evidence. Youth drinking goes up without exposure or go down, goes down uh, Goes, that do, goes up with exposure or grows down without it? Yes. And is there an analogy? Yes. This is very similar to what we sound, found with tobacco marketing. How does this effect work? Got another study, about 5,000 young people looked at a whole lot of exposures, videos on the internet, showing someone drunk or high, pictures or comments on a social networking site, showing or talking about someone who's drunk, movies showing someone drunk or high, TV programs showing someone drunk or high, alcohol ads on billboards, magazines, or somewhere else, songs talking about getting drunk or high, video games showing someone getting drunk or high. What they found is greater exposure <clears throat> to substance-related media increases young people's normative beliefs about pure alcohol use which then predicts greater alcohol use during adolescence. In other words, media and in particular social media is a super peer. Implications of this, we need to integrate this kind of normative feedback into our interventions, we need to do much more media literacy among young people, but also we need more effective public policies that will block the ads from reaching the kids. And here's an example of an alcohol ad functioning as a super peer. I'm really excited about where we are right now. We're all trading off each other's culture. So no matter what lines you put, country, indie, rock, rap, we're all somehow going to find a way to come together. That's it. That's what it's all about. We are finally living out our creed. We are finally living out our creed, we're drinking Budweiser. All right, the main way that alcohol advertising is regulated in the US is through the industry's voluntary self-regulation. Here's just one example I like to use, the Distilled Spirits Council of the US or Discus, their code says, beverage alcohol advertising and market materials should not primarily appeal to individuals below the legal purchase age, but apparently it's okay to use a quote from Dr. Seuss, why fit in when you were born to stand out that clearly appeals to adolescents. The problem is it's very difficult, if not impossible, to prove that this primarily appeals so this kind of advertising is okay. I could show you so many more examples of this. I don't have to. My colleagues have reviewed the literature, more than 100 studies in multiple countries. The industry gets an F for regulating itself, whether it's content or exposure. Alcohol industry self-regulation is not effective at protecting young people. Now, in the age of COVID-19, alcohol marketing has morphed. The chief marketing officer of Anheuser-Busch InBev in the U.S. said, I think now if there's still someone doing marketing or doing self-serving campaigns, these times are officially over and officially gone. So what Anheuser-Busch shifted to was talking a lot about all the wonderful things it was doing 
to combat the pandemic, converting its breweries to produce hand sanitizer, devoting $5 million to the Red Cross, creating open for takeout to help bars and restaurants um, be locatable by people looking for them, launching a student loan relief program to help students pay off their loans, sponsoring streaming, streaming workouts, and don donating $100,000 to women helping their local communities during the pandemic. Now, I just want to remind you, alcohol is not a great match for COVID-19 in the short term. It suppresses multiple aspects, aspects of the body's immune system response with particular effects on our lungs' ability to fight infection. And off-premise sales have been up considerably, accompanied by an increase in police calls for domestic violence and emergency room presentations of child abuse. In the longer term, we know what happened after SARS, the World Trade Center disaster, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. After each of those, in one to two years, there was a significant increase in alcohol use disorders and youth drinking. And people were more likely to be drinking more or to have an, developed an alcohol use disorder the closer they were to the event. But here's what the industry is telling us during COVID. This buds for the blues. The Reds and the Warriors. This buds for the magic, the athletics, the Giants, and the Jazz. This buds for the Trailblazers the Braves, the Yankees, and the Angels. This buds for the home team. So I wanna shift a little bit. I wanna pull back and talk to you about the sea change that's happened in marketing. In this era, so much of marketing is digital and it's so different from the traditional marketing that we've mostly studied and that people like me grew up with. Digital marketing, marketing and social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it is participatory. It is algorithmic and data driven. It is dark and ephemeral. That is, it's very difficult to track, very difficult to monitor. You and I can be on the same page on the web at the same time and see completely different advertising based on the context. That is where we came from on the web before we hit that page, uh, on our geography, where we live, and on what the platforms already know about our behaviors in the uh, digital space already, they have so much information about us. And then finally, it, uh, then it is material, it creates in the moment experiences, particularly with mobile, they can serve you ads on your phone that are relevant to the store that's right in front of you. And it's logistical, there's a seamless flow from identifying your preferences to targeting the ad to presenting you with a purchase opportunity. And who's minding these stores? These stores of data being collected are perhaps the most challenging area of alcohol marketing currently. Our current regulatory and self-regulatory codes, they're all 20th century. They're all about content and exposure. They don't touch what digital marketing does. And the story I love to tell is just before the pandemic hit, the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance, which is a group I'm part of, we had our world conference in Dublin, Ireland. And there was a contingent of young people from DARE in the US, teenagers, high school students who came to that conference. When they landed in Dublin, they immediately turned on their phones and they searched Global Alcohol Policy Conference. Because they used the word alcohol, they started getting served alcohol ads. 
That's how it works. We're no longer dealing with content volume and placement. We're now dealing with data optimized engagement with consumers, including young people. Now, one of the most effective things to do here from my mind would be counter advertising. This is really effective in tobacco. There's been no money for this in alcohol. This is an example of uh, something we did with a youth group in Baltimore. It was great media literacy for them. Clever takeoff on uh, the Colt 45. Uh, the um, marketing works every time, same logo, same script, but then they created their own product, Barf Beer, Beer and Alcohol Ruined Futures with images that tell a different story about consequences of alcohol use than you'll ever see in a regular alcohol ad. But no money, they put them on buttons, posters, uh, and some backpacks. All right, so what do we do? On the product, the model is those alcohol impact barriers areas and bans on specific products. Pricing, alcohol tax increases, and where it's possible, setting a floor. Minimum unit pricing is what that's called, so that the industry can't discount so low that alcohol is cheaper than everything else. It got so low in Florida at one point, you could practically get a six pack for free. Place, lots of tools around licensing and zoning reform in many places, except New York State, where you're almost entirely preempted by Albany. The action has to happen in Albany in New York State. And then promotion, Dealing with the local issues, billboards, public transit, and retail signage, which localities can often do something about, as well as trying out the counter advertising. On the social media, we have to take on the platforms. We have given our democracy away to unregulated, highly profitable giants. We've been trying to have a conversation with Facebook along with the tobacco folks, the food folks, et cetera. We've gotten nowhere so far, we'll keep trying. And then use local powers to address the rest of the marketing bubble. With social media, transparency is crucial. We must require that these giants disclose their partnerships with influencers, influencers and peer generated content. We must disclose and permit regulation of the stores of data that support the data optimized engagement with consumers and young, including young people. But these are global platforms. We're gonna have to have global action. So who is gonna take the lead? Well, who is taking the lead? The World Health Organization has a really great safer platform that sums up the most effective things, strengthen restrictions on availability, advance and enforce drink driving countermeasures, facilitate access to screening and brief intervention, enforce bans or restrictions on alcohol advertising and raise the prices. Nice mnemonic. We need a global instrument to really deal with this. A lot of us are talking about the need for a global treaty on alcohol control. The model is the global framework on convent, uh, con the global framework convention on tobacco control. 168 countries have signed it. It was negotiated by WHO in the early 2000s. It sets a floor, a minimum that, that countries commit to and it has the ability to address global and cross-border actions, which is social media. The internet knows no national boundaries. We can't do this alone. After all this, you may be depressed. I wanna remind you, I'm very, very hopeful. We know so much more about this problem than we did when I started in this field 35 years ago. It's so much clearer what we need to do. So I just wanna remind you in closing, that part of our job is to create hope, to carry hope. And uh, I love this quote from the Chinese poet and essayist Lu Xun, hope is like a road in the country. There was never a road, but when many people walk on it, the road can, comes into existence. We can do this. We can build the road to longer lives, better health, more safety for our young people. And then Margaret Mead, never doubt, that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. My friends, it is such a pleasure to speak with you. I wish I could be there in person, but I believe that you, that we are those people. Thank you so much for all you do, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Jernigan, for sharing your research and the uh, robust body of research that is out there around this. Um, 
a lot to process. I want to remind everybody you will be receiving the slides, so you don't have to memorize everything. Um, but I, there's definitely work to be done on, on all our parts. So we thank you for your message and uh, sharing all the information. So before we dive into the Q&A, which I'm sure everybody's anxious to get to, we would appreciate everyone's feedback um, on tonight's presentation. Uh, you can simply point your phone at the QR code that you see on your screen. It will take you to an extremely short survey. I promise it's very short uh, and we would appreciate your feedback on this. It, we will put this slide back up again at the end of the Q&A. So if you prefer to do it then, please do so. And it will also be included as a link in the email that you will receive tomorrow. So no excuses for not filling it out. And it is very informative as we think about how we plan the speaker series going forward. So we thank you in advance. I'd also like to invite everybody to join us for next month's speaker, uh, Dr. Matt Bellis, supporting teens in reducing their stress and ours. Um, he, if you've not heard him before, you don't wanna miss it. He's not only knowledgeable as a psychologist, um, but brings some, some humor to his presentation. So try to join us for that. All right, so at this time, we will begin our Q&A and joining our speaker, is Richard Julius from Student Assistance Services. Richard is a licensed clinical social worker and credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor. He currently coordinates the Student Assistance Services Strengthening Families Program and is a road counselor. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Colleen who will be moderating the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Dr. Jernigan, will some of the uh, pandemic related changes like alcohol delivery, takeout be permanent? There is our efforts all over the country to make them permanent. And this is one of the things that we as a prevention field need to be ready for and ready to fight. As I said in my presentation, it's going to be a while before we have the public health research on the effects of that on consumption and problems. It's okay. There's something much more straightforward that local coalitions can do, which is you can either on your own or join with local law enforcement uh, and do some compliant checks around home delivery. When the California uh, Alcoholic Beverage Commission did this, they found an 80% failure rate in terms of checking IDs and delivery to minors. All you need is a small study 10, 20 times where you try this and see what happened and you've got local data. That gives you a seat at the table, which is what you want in these policy conversations that are gonna be going forward. Thank you. Can uh, underage youth purchase alcohol online and are there any ID checks? So this is, there's only one study that has been done of online purchasing of alcohol. It was done several years ago. So it's a gap in the research. That study found that at that time, there was about a 50% failure rate in terms of sales to minors. It is highly problematic. It's a mess. I mean, it ends up in the hands of an Uber driver and the Uber driver is not trained to deal with identification, to deal with fake IDs, to identify a fake ID, any of that. Um, so we get failure. Okay, thank you. Richard, I'm gonna pose this question to you. What can parents do in terms of counteracting the normalization of alcohol and drinking that teens see on social media? Um, we find it healthy and, and helpful uh, if parents have a clear, consistent message about no use, uh, rather than uh, trying to point out you know, all of the hazards just keeping it clear that uh, it's best if the young people just don't start using and continue to uh, drive that message home. Okay. I want to just piggyback on that, Colleen. And sure. I work with college students. What we find in the college population is the young people whose parents let them drink at home during high school are the ones with the biggest problems with drinking in college. It's a myth that college drinking is about inexperienced drinkers suddenly being set free and it explode and it exploding. The message to high school parents is exactly what Richard said. The clear no use message, such a favor to our children. Okay, and someone wrote in, what can parents do at home to limit al access to alcohol? Richard, you want that one? You want me to do it? Uh, you can take it. Okay. Again, clear message, this is a special product. 
If you have guns in the home, hopefully you're going to lock them up. If you have alcohol in the home, hopefully you're going to lock it up. You're going to put it someplace where it's not readily accessible. And you're also going to model, if you drink, you're going to model drinking that's in line with the dietary guidelines for America's Americans, which is no more than two drinks a day for males, no more than one drink a day for females. Uh, this, I should say the advisory committee this time around for the dietary guidelines tried to get the male one dropped to one drink a day for males, because that's really what the research literature shows. If you're going to be a low risk drinker, no more than one drink a day. And that doesn't mean we're recommending that you have a drink every day. But if you're going to drink on a day, no more than one. Children learn so much from what their parents do. Right. And Colleen, I'll just jump in here. Uh, obviously, this is a collaborative a coalition. So all those that are out there watching, I would encourage you to connect with your local coalitions because there are a lot of resources and how you can open up the dialogue and keep the lines of communication open because I think that's key to being able to share information and to kind of walk next to our young people as opposed to lecturing them. Yeah, I'm gonna pitch another resource to folks, which is if your children are in college, we have something called collegeparentsmatter.org, which is a set of scripts, research-based, et cetera, for how to use teachable moments, golden opportunities, to have those conversations with your children. They're all open-ended questions. They're non-judgmental. They're to get the conversation going. It's an incredible resource, collegeparentsmatter.org. Okay, thank you. Richard, this one might be for you. Can you speak about shepherding kids through the latter two years of high school? Uh, this one parent says they have a very clear uh, rules about not drinking ever or drugs. And so far we have had total buy-in and compliance, but we know at some point that will change. Can you speak about that as kids enter their latter teenage years? I wouldn't normalize it by thinking that this is something that a, a young person is going to do. Uh, encourage them if they've already been living uh, a clean, healthy lifestyle to continue doing that point out, you know, some of the benefits that they've already gotten, and maybe even point, it to, point them to some of the privileges that they're looking forward to, i.e. driving, those types of things, and how, you know, one can impact and interfere with the others uh, to keep them uh, moving ahead, uh, just, you know, staying off and continuing to abstain. Okay, thank you. Here's another one. My husband is a heavy drinker. I'm the complete opposite. This is being an issue between us. We have an 18 and 17 year old boys. They are not drinking yet, at least not at home. But I'm afraid they choose to think that this is something normal and exceed with it. I would like to have the right words to teach them limits. Richard, would you like to take that one? You're addressing that to me, okay. Um, the right words are, uh, again, continuing to point out how they've made it this far, uh, not using and encourage them to continue to not using and just start looking at and having those conversations with them about what they're trying to achieve and how that will not be interfered with by them, you know, uh, using. Uh, so they need to just continue to abstain and just keep moving forward in that direction. I'm going to piggyback there a little bit, just that piece about having the conversation so important. When our kids were teenagers, we lived four blocks from school and we drove them. And the reason we drove them is for car time. That time when they're in the car, they're sitting next to you, they're so much more likely to talk to you. And we wanted to keep the dialogue open and happening. Um, it's important to talk to them about alcohol. It's also important to talk to them about the marketing. And this relates to one of the questions that was in the Q and A is um, what's the single message that I would give to adolescents around all this? It's that there are really big companies trying to manipulate you into drinking. They are spending billions of dollars because they're counting on 
you being convinced by their marketing to start drinking. They know that the earlier you start drinking, the more you'll drink for the rest of your life. The, you may become, the more likely you'll become one of their best customers, which is somebody with an alcohol use disorder. So in my experience, adolescents hate being manipulated by adults and that message of manipulation in the marketing. It's just, again, when our kids were teens and the alcohol ads would come on, I would make fun of them. We joke about them. We talk about what wasn't being showed on the ad stuff like that. Okay. And I would also, let me just add that um, Stanford has a great toolkit just in terms of processing media literacy. David, I think that's such a, uh, a great point. Um, it readily accessible in terms of starting conversations. They have some sample ads that you can unpack with your child and discuss kind of what, what's going on in these ads. So it, it's a interactive discussion point. Um, the other thing that I do want to add, which I know all the coalitions um, make an effort in their local communities to highlight is that despite what parents may think, I wanna under, underscore this here, despite what parents may think, year after year after year in national surveys, the number one influencer of whether young people choose to use any sort of substance or not is their parents. So even though we as parents may not feel like they're listening or it's falling on deaf ears, that's not the case. So I would encourage everybody to, to stay strong, stick with it, it does matter. Okay, great. Dr. Jernigan, how do you suggest a coalition or organization build the political will to push forward the more effective strategies? What a great question. I teach campaigning and organizing at my School of Public Health. So there are lots of ways to do this. I'm a great believer in retail organizing, which is organizing based on relationships. You know people, those people know people. Who do you know? Who do you know that knows somebody else? How can you start building the relationships that can build political will? In our side of the field, we're never gonna have the money that the alcohol industry has. But what we have is we have people and we have data. I'm the data guy, but I can't do this without you. When I go to Capitol Hill, when I go to a state legislature, I love going with people from coalitions because you have the stories. I can give the numbers, but your stories, your experiences are so important. And you may not feel like you matter very much to your elected officials, but I can tell you, you matter a whole lot to your elected officials, especially in this era when so many of our elections are so close. Um, so it's relationship building, it's getting involved with those coalitions, but it's building your networks, concentric circles of people you know, who know other people, who know other people, and talking about these issues, getting people talking, getting people thinking, listening to them, listening their best thoughts and sharing yours. Thank you. Are there any regulations regarding THC and alcohol beverages? Yes, at this point in the US, you cannot put THC in an alcoholic beverage so far. What you can do is put THC in a beverage and package it like alcohol. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. They're making THC laced beverages that look like beer. And cannabis at this point is completely the wild, wild west. I have a book coming out from the American Public Health Association in August that looks at if we're going to legalize, and it's is really targeted to places like New York State, if you're going to legalize, what does the public health research say is the best way to do that? And I'll give you a hint. It's not the way almost all the states are doing it. That's not good from a public health perspective. It's not good from a social justice perspective. Uh, we're making lots of really obvious mistakes where if we paid attention to the experience we've had with tobacco and alcohol, as well as the experience we've had in the legalized states among cannabis and in other countries, we'd be a whole lot smarter. The book doesn't take a position on legalization. It just says, look, if you're gonna try this experiment, here's the safest way to do it. Okay, thank you. I have another one for you, Dr. Jernigan. Can you recommend an educational point you would stress delivering to high school youth and young adults that might hit home? Yeah, it's what I said earlier. It's you're being manipulated. This industry is counting on you being fooled into drinking at a young age. 
they know that the consequences will be much greater the earlier you start drinking. And they want that to be the case because they're dependent on you. We have a new study that's coming out uh, in a couple of weeks where we calculate the amount of money that alcohol companies make in the US on underage drinking, $17.5 billion in revenues from the alcohol that kids are consuming. That's a lot of money. And it makes clearer than ever to me, the basic conflict of interest, this industry says they don't want kids to drink. They're making billions of dollars off of that consumption. Okay. And do you have any suggestions on how we work to prevent airplane sized liquors at convenience stores and gas stations? State yeah, liquor uh, start, oh, go ahead. Now, this is a really good question, and I am going to send you to the lawyers on this one, because every state is so different around this. So if you have local legal folks who can help you with it, that's one thing. If you don't, there's a group that has a contract with National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to provide legal expertise to local coalitions around alcohol policy. They're called Change Lab Solutions. Change Lab Solutions. If you look them on the web, they're located in California and they've got lawyers. They've got lawyers who are experts on alcohol policy. And for a specific question like that, airplane bottles in New York state, you're gonna have issues about what's the level of local control you have in New York. What's the, what has the state already done? Could, do you have to do this in Albany? Could you do this something locally? Those are the kinds of questions that they can help you with. Okay, thank you. And how can we work on tax reform in New York state when it is a preempted state? I Plus, love this question. New York politicians have chosen to use recreation marijuana to raise tax revenue instead of raising tax on alcohol. Yeah, I love this question. So. When we talk taxes in New York state, you all are coalitions and you need a strong coalition of coalitions because we need everybody singing from the same songbook uh, in the public health field uh, and getting to the folks who are in uh, Albany. You've had some big changes in Albany. You may be about to have some more big changes in Albany, who knows? Um, but we're in a moment in Albany where there's a chance for some more progressive things perhaps to, ha perhaps to happen. This is a great time to be having just this conversation. And I do a lot of work with coalitions on taxes. Uh, if you have folks in New York State who want to work on taxes, uh, get in touch with me. And again, I'll put you in touch with other folks as well. Taxes are perhaps the single most effective thing we could do to prevent alcohol-related problems across the board. And it is something we do so seldom. Okay, I think I'm out of questions. So if either one of you have any closing thoughts. Richard, I've done most of the talking, take it away. <laughs> the only thing I would add is that, and, and I like to say this to parents a lot, uh, you're thinking that you're going to be able to replicate pressures that your young child is going to experience when they're out of the home, in the home is completely erroneous, can't happen. All right, so thinking that you're going to help teach somebody something when they're sitting in front of you is not going to work out when they are out and they're about amongst their peers or in other social environments where the pressures are totally different than when they're at home with you. So don't try to do that. Doesn't work, can't work. So I have another message for parents, but it's gonna echo that one because it is about peer pressure. As adults, we have peer pressure. As adults, we are victim to the myth that everybody's drinking. And part of the reason for this is because the drinkers make all the noise. They are the most visible. And I challenge my adult friends, if you've made a decision not to drink, to talk about it with people, to be visible as a non-drinker. The most incredible stuff that we've done in this country around alcohol has come from people deciding to be open about their personal decisions. I'm talking about the temperance movement. I'm not talking about prohibition. 
Those were two very different things. Temperance was originally a movement in solidarity with the addict. It was, I'm not going to drink because I've seen the effects of this product on so many people I care about, and I don't want to be part of that. We need a similar movement in this era of people who are willing to say, this product has caused enough damage. This industry has made enough changes in our communities. We're done. And it's time for us to be more visible and more vocal about whether we're a very, very light drinker or whether we've made a decision not to drink at all. And I would argue our kids need us to be talking about that. And we easily feel ashamed. There's such a stigma to not drinking. That's the point of the marketing is to make us feel like we're odd and not cool. That's exactly what our kids are experiencing. If we can model that for our kids as adults, our, our kids will have a better shot. You are so kind in having me and letting me spout off on all these things. Um, I have been doing this a long time. I am extremely hopeful and I'm extremely grateful to all the people who are on this uh, webinar, uh, to all the folks working so hard in coalitions. You could be doing other things with your time and you've chosen to do this. And thank you, thank you, thank you. So I think we will wrap up on that very uh, poignant note that's spot on as usual, Dr. Jernigan. I will share the survey uh, QR code again for those that didn't get a chance the first time around. Uh, I want to thank you, Richard, for joining us with your mm -hmm. insightful parenting expertise. And Dr. Jernigan, I can't uh, thank you enough for really sharing so much information, so much valuable information, and really for uh, foremost, giving us hope that there, there is a direction to head in that can make our communities better. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we hope to see you all in May and we wish you a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.